Okay, so tell me when you want to start. All right, I'm going to go live in just one second. Okay. I'm Steve Horn, chairman of the HBS Club of Houston. Uh, welcome to Lessons Learned from the 2021 Texas Blackout that we are co-sponsoring with the Center for Houston's Future. In addition, we have audience from the Houston, Harvard University Club of Houston and the Yale Club of Houston, as well as the HBS clubs of Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio. It was a statewide blackout. I would also like to thank the corporate sponsors of the HBS Club of Houston, Lock Lord, SCF Partners, Simmons Energy, and Westside and Northside Lexus. I asked Bob Harvey, the CEO of Greater Houston Partnership, on who should speak on the blackout, and he suggested two people to consider as speakers. We're fortunate to have both. Pat Wood III is the past chairman of the Public Utility Commission of Texas from 1995 to 2001, when the Texas electric market was restructured to inject competition. Subsequently, Pat was chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Today, as CEO of Hunt Energy Network, Pat's focus is on new power system infrastructure and the related business systems to integrate it in a competitive power market. Pat has a BS in civil engineering from Texas A&M and a JD from Harvard Law School. Brett Perlman, who will be moderating the program, is the CEO of the Center for Houston's Future, a nonprofit that focuses on developing consensus-based solutions to important social issues in the Houston region. Brett served on the PUC of Texas with Pat and subsequently involved in a number of electric power-related companies. He holds a master's in public policy from Harvard, a JD from the University of Texas, and an undergraduate degree from Northwestern University. He was a fellow at the Advanced Leadership Initiative at Harvard before his current position. I'll now turn the program over to Brett. Thank you very much for attending. Well, Pat, it's uh, great to do this again. We used to have these discussions in front of our 200 closest friends, you know, about 20 years ago, right? Uh, when we were both on the commission. So uh, it's always a pleasure to do this with you. I always learn so much when uh, when I hear you speak, and so really um, appreciate you uh, agreeing to uh, to do this. So it just struck me that we have all three uh, the, three of the major um, graduate schools at Harvard. We have uh, Harvard Law School, uh, we got the Business School, and uh, we got uh, we have the Kennedy School. So uh, uh, three powerhouses here, and um, uh, just so pleased to uh, uh, to have Steve invite us to do this and and spend a few minutes talking about, uh, you know, this topic that's very close to both of our hearts. Uh, just for the audience, I think what we're going to do is um, Pat's going to give a few minutes of introductory comments. Uh, I will ask him a few comments af after that, and then we'll turn it over uh, to questions. I know that you all have a lot of questions, and we want to spend as much time as we can on questions. What I'd like for you to do is to put your questions into the chat feature. Uh, and then we will synthesize them and um, uh, Laura, who is working on my team, will put them into Q&A and we'll get started uh, answering them uh, after we have a few minutes of discussion. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, Pat, I want to turn it over to you and let you just give a few introductory remarks, uh, talk a little bit about your perspective on, um, on what happened on President's Day and, uh, and uh, help, help, help us understand uh, uh, where we are today. So I'll turn it over to you, Pat. Thank you, Brett. And thank you all for giving us uh, your dinner hour tonight. Um, I appreciate the interest and certainly always uh, appreciate our shared affinity with uh, a distant but wonderful uh, university up there on the Charles. Uh, I never dreamed that we would, all the L.L. Bean clothes that I bought my first fall when I moved up to uh, the law school in 86, a roommate of a hallmate of mine said, man, that wardrobe of yours just ain't going to cut it. So he said, we're going to Freeport. So Freeport, I found out was up there in Maine. And I got all the LL Bean clothes that I needed. And you know what, they still fit because I used them last month. And uh, I thought about our many cold winters up there. But uh, that's a city that knows how to deal with winter. Where we live today is not. Um, and we found out that our state wasn't either. 
let me give a little background. Um, you know, the the electric um, region of Texas is kind of a unique spot, and it's one that I, as a regulator, uh, both inside of it and outside of it, got uh, I guess a unique perspective on it. But um, let me just make sure, Brett, that's showing up, isn't it? Yes, it is. We can see it. All right, I'm I'm kind of about a C plus on Zoom, so I love it, but uh, I'm not the best at it. We are uh, our own interconnection. You've heard this probably kicked around a lot in the last month, but uh, we there's an eastern interconnection, which are pretty much all the states do north of Amarillo to the east, and then there's a western interconnection, which is everybody else, and then there's us right here as a as a interesting historical construct back in the 30s when uh, the Federal Power Act was passed and gave a Federal Power Commission, later FERC, the jurisdiction over interstate commerce and electricity. <laughs> the utilities in North Texas and, and uh, I guess throughout Texas all said, well, we'll just quit being in interstate commerce and they broke the tie right there across the river um, and uh, then in 78, when there was a merger of a Dallas based Central Southwest with uh, utilities in Oklahoma, they rejoined that, that thing and that created instant jurisdiction. A, a midnight order was done, and you'll see the two arrows right there North Tie and East Tie were done to effectively uh, connect the uh, Eastern Interconnect with ERCOT. Um, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, which is what ERCOT stands for, um, to allow that corporation to be one company. But it was a direct current tie, which is a, a controllable flow of electricity, unlike most everything else in the electric world that just flows where, where voltage uh, allows it to flow. That's really where uh, how electric grids work. But anyway, this, that's just a historical anomaly. We've since built some ties to Mexico, which you'll see there on the bottom. And there are other parts of Texas that are not part of ERCOT, the Panhandle being the most prominent, the CERC, which is really the energy region where I grew up over there in Port Arthur, um, Southwest Parapool up in, in the north uh, east part of the state, and then El Paso is part of the Western Interconnect. So uh, as the FERC regulator, I got to oversee those other um, power pools. Uh, the Southwest Parapool is much like ERCOT and organized centrally dispatched market um, that uh, really runs as a regional integrated unit. CERC uh, is part of Entergy, is part of the MICE, the Midwest Independent System Operator, which is another entity much like ERCOT and the SPP. So you've got a number of these regional entities that uh, that are across the nation. And so um, anyway, let's, let's hop to the, let's hop to the very uh, seminal and memorable days of, of, uh, last month when we all kind of woke up and, and saw this. Um, this was our, our weather map. Uh, the, let me close that one. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I see my weather map. My, okay, it looks like if you put the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians there, it looked like somebody just poured pink water from Canada and it just let it flow all the way down to the Rio Grande. It actually went farther south, went into Mexico as well, but that huge polar vortex came as a result of shifts in the jet stream significantly far to the south. Um, I won't say farther than it's ever been, but farther than we've seen in a hell of a long time and really brought that cold, cold air from, from the North Pole down through Canada and, and hit between the two mountain ranges in the US and it just sat there. And it crept farther south over time, um, particularly as we got to um, you know, midnight of uh, Valentine's Day to the to the twenty uh, the, the fifteenth of February. I caught the President's Day the freeze out, but that uh, that that cold air came farther and farther south as we got into uh, into the night. Let me step through that day with y'all. Um, stop share, reshare, and get through this one. Um, this uh, this was a this was the two weeks or maybe about ten days looks like ten days kind of prior to uh, the fifteenth of uh, February. So you've got here back in these days, if, <laughs> as as we wish uh, wish you could remember a month ago. But um, here's the here's the temperature in Dallas. So this is uh, this is blue. 
The guy who draws the chart works for me in Dallas, so I didn't tell him to change it to Houston. Sorry, sorry, y'all. Sugar <laughs> Texas is Texas, but you know it. It, uh, it was a different. It was a different pattern. Green is wind. Solar is yellow. Blue is natural gas. Uh, brown is coal, and red is nuclear. So you've got really you see here as wind really took a big expansive part. Take the eighth of February, for example. It's a pretty big player. In a moderate day, that looked like it was in the 50s in the evening and got up to the 70s in the day, so 60s perhaps. So gas kind of takes, uh, takes the, the, uh, the float. So if you got a lot of wind, gas backs down, and even rarely coal backs down. Usually coal is harder plant, those plants and nuclear plants are so impossible to back down. You really ideally for safety and, and for efficiency want to run those flat at all times, but uh, we used to run coal that way as well. But I think the biggest change in as we've gotten much more renewables here in Texas, as you see uh, the impact here uh, on even uh, causing back down of coal plants. Well, that changed as the weather started to uh, get cooler as we became uh, before the weekend started. Here's the weekend, here's the 12th, which is Friday, Saturday, Valentine's Day, President's Day. So the week before, we started seeing um, the temperatures drop. They started to drop pretty dramatically as we got through the weekend. Um, I don't know if any of y'all were in that part of Texas. My brother-in-law called. He was in uh, Snyder, Texas, and he said, the fog is freezing. I said, well, every, the whole state's freezing. He goes, no, literally, I walk out and the fog hits my windbreaker and it turns to ice. And I thought, oh, man. And I didn't really connect that dot all the way until... I heard about the icicles, eight foot long icicles on the windmills. We have thousands of windmills from kind of Abilene all the way up past Amarillo. That's just a very rich spot for uh, renewable uh, development over the last 20 years. And to, to think about freezing fog, which I hadn't really ever heard of, I'm sure there's some meteorological condition, but that started actually a little early. So you'll see that, that happened right here as, as these wind uh, we don't generally have a lot of wind in the winter, and I'll show you a chart that kind of in, anticipates that. But these two days here, we actually got a, a pretty good drop off of wind because of that freezing of the wind farms in the west part of the state. We do have more and more wind down in the south on the coast. But as you'll see here in a minute, wind is kind of an interesting player in this story. Not quite the villain that some want it to be. I actually feel like canceling my subscription to our beloved Wall Street Journal because <laughs> Just the intellectual dishonesty over this over this whole this whole freeze when when enlightenment is called for. But nonetheless, we move on. But uh, what happened here was we hit a system peak right about the time Mrs. Wood and I were having our Valentine's Day dinner. Uh, this was 7 p.m. on um, on Valentine's Day. We hit a winter peak, 69.2. Uh, the prior peak was around 65, so we were up pretty high. But the scary thing was that the next two days we're looking to be equal to our summer peak from 2019. That was our summer peak right on top of it and then exceeding that on Monday morning and Tuesday morning as we came back up. And that was scary. All of us uh, former commissioners were on a text chain and we were all basically starting to crap in our pants when we saw this stuff coming out. But we got through the night there okay and then boom, Two o'clock, I was awakened by um, our uh, lights kind of popping off. And I saw that and the lights weren't on, but you could hear every, the little fan and everything stop. And um, I thought, oh gosh, we got ice on the distribution feeder out here. I was actually not aware for the next two days because I lost internet, I lost cell phone, I lost everything. I had some backup generation, thank the Lord, and some solar and batteries. Um, like my friend John Berger has, but uh, those that uh, I had no idea that my outage was not a distribution outage, but one that that was rolled across the whole state. Um, we ended up dropping. Now I'll really share my skills here. Uh, we ended up dropping. Uh, where is my chart? Okay. We end up dropping a significant amount of generation. This is what we were expecting to have. This is what we have on nameplate. This is what we expect to have in the winter, middle column. 
78,000 or 78 gigawatts is the best way to think about that. Here's what we actually had the next day, that day after uh, the rolling outages were called. And here's why they were called. They were called because we were depending on that much gas due to the severe weather conditions, we had that much. We were depending on this much wind, we got that much. Coal also dropped, even the nuke drop, which never drops. We had the nuke drop about 5.30 that morning. Um, apparently it was reported by the, the uh, one of the operators of the nuke that, and that's one here in Houston, our nuke, there's two, there's one near Dallas, one near Houston, that uh, there was a, a frozen, a water pump line that, that froze. So um, solar kind of, you know, it's only there in the daytime, but it actually did okay. It hollered about, you know, these small, small resources down here. But this is dramatic, y'all. I mean, this, this doesn't happen anywhere. I don't think there's ever been an outage. Uh, you know, everything is big in Texas. This is one contest I wish we didn't have to win, but uh, this was a significant uh, reduction in uh in power brett i mean we've we've all been through it I, what what the ERCOT has to do ERCOT is a the air traffic controller that really makes sure in every minute of the day that supply and demand are in balance and so and that means 60 hertz you hear something hurts hertz is frequencies per second every device that we have in our offices in our life in north america is operates on 60 hertz and so every power grid that is the absolute non-negotiable uh, standard that has to be met. And it's generally met by bringing on more generation or turning a ga you know, gas plant or bringing now batteries up and down. But what happens is when you've got everything on you can and then you start to see it all freeze off, the air traffic controller, i.e. ERCOT, has no choice but to go to the maximum uh, state of emergency, which is EE03, and drop load. So they sent out orders across the state to people, center point is where they send them here in Houston to Encore in Dallas and West Texas, AEP down in the South, Texas, New Mexico, co-ops, munis, everybody gets a pro rata order. We're dropping this much generation uh, and they end up dropping about 10,000 at first and then as much as 19.5 thousand. So 19,500 megawatts were dropped really through the day. And that's a significant drop. Our prior outage in 2011, Brett, as you may remember that when you were gone by then, but it, it was about 5,000 megawatts over about a seven hour period. This continued for several days. Um, uh, I'm not gonna bring up another chart. Uh, this continued for several days uh, for Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, things started to recover late Wednesday. Uh, I know my power, Hour, did not go out after Wednesday night. And then Thursday and Friday, things really returned to normal. So that's what happened on the operational side. There's some financial implications of that that are ongoing today that are extremely significant. And of course, as business school grads and then the lawyers among us are fascinated by slightly different but equally impactful parts of this as well, is that the, um, the, the state under our market design that we set up here back in 1995 has a de has a competitive market. People call it deregulated, but I mean, that's fine. I, I, I don't find that an ugly word, but it's not too accurate because um, there's plenty of regulation in a, in a competitive power market. But we open that market up so that people other than utilities to, could compete to buy and sell power uh, back in 1995. And then we opened it up further to eliminate the retail franchise in, two, in 90, and it opened in 2002. Brett was still there. He was, uh, I got to be Moses looking over the land, but you got to be <laughs> Joshua going down into it and he got to open it up. But uh, at the time I was pulled up to FERC to clean up a California energy crisis. So <laughs> where Pat Wood goes, crises follow, I hate to say. Um, but anyway, that that and oh, that step in 01, 02 uh, was the opening of the retail market, which in not all, but most of the state allows people, us in Houston, for example, to be able to select our retail energy provider and negotiate for that like we do for phone service or for groceries or you know, pretty much anything else you do, cable, um, your car, anything. Yeah, you know, it's much more of a, a market commodity um, as we think it probably should be. But we gave, as a political compromise, we gave um, co-ops and munis 
the opportunity to stay in the traditional vertically integrated uh, system. But we're all still drinking from the same pond. And that's why, even though we all have different regulatory structures in San Antonio and Houston being really the largest two um, regulated entities in the state, most other parts remaining are being competitive. Um, we all do share the same, uh, the same pond. And so that pond is the ERCOT market that was shown by the Texas map in the first drawing. So when, uh, when things got stressed for one, they got stressed for all. We did have our, our neighbors next door in Southwest Parapool also had uh, some rotating outages, not to the near, not to the significance that we did in, in duration or in scope. Um, we had outages in Louisiana as well due to the weather and that persisted up as the as really the, the vortex kind of slid slowly to the east and then pulled back up to, to the Canada. We, um, we saw some normal outages, but the outages that we get for, um, for Katrina, or not Katrina, for uh, Ike and Harvey are, are really outages based on the infrastructure to the local poles and wires that serve us. This was an outage based on the supply of electricity from the power pool, the statewide pool. And that's an unusual event, probably less than, less than a quarter of a percent of all outages over time are supply related because we generally have a very robust or have had, I should say up to now, a robust supply of supply across uh, all of North America. It's been a blessing for our country and certainly for our state as we've um, you know, welcomed a lot of new people and a lot of new businesses here. One of the attractivenesses here is our, our, our wealth of energy. But this event, the third coldest winter in Texas recorded history, um, some people try to poo poo it, but there was a good testimony to Texas legislature uh, on the opening days of this hearing. I don't know, Brett, if you saw those, but that, that yeah, felt- about 14 hours of it. <laughs> that, that meteorologist was awesome. I mean, that really hit home to me. I said, well, I know it's cold, but you know, to have that guy saying in geographic breadth, it's all 254 counties were under winter storm watch, which means it yeah. is here and it's happening. Um, it went into Mexico even after a day, they said, hey, we're tired of sending you power. We need it back. <laughs> they, were, they were feeding us. We had power coming in through those limited ties that we were on that showed on the first map. But, uh, you know, by the end of the thing, it, by the end of the deal, it got to Mexico, but in breadth and in intensity, and it was an extremely damp storm. So um, and dampness doesn't mean it's pretty white snow that's fluffy and falls on the ground. It means it is wet and it, it, it provides a lot of ice. So we saw significant icing on roads, particularly uh, west, of, uh, west of Austin where we've got a lot of oil and gas production. So we saw the interplay here, which about, Brett, you and I can talk about that. And, yeah. and I, I know we were gonna head to that question about gas and electric, but that, you know, the, the significance of, um, of this storm can't be understated, but I think it's the job of us who care about this. And some of you I know on the call are involved in the energy business. Um, you know, we've enjoyed for, 25 years, the benefits of this competitive, um, highly competitive, low cost um, energy market. It's gas and electric going crazy and a lot of competition keeping margins that, you know, probably too low for some of us, but, uh, you know, it's been a robust uh, magnet for people and for businesses, but um, so we get we get kind of complacent, and I think uh, some planning issues here are what, what a lot of people are asking. Why didn't we Why didn't we plan for this? And yeah. Think, so why Why don't we uh, maybe talk a little bit about that, Pat? Um, you know, you mentioned a, a few minutes ago that ERCOT, um, you know, has to keep the grid in balance at sixty hertz all the time. So one of the things that happened immediately was they draw. You know, when the load when the generation started dropping. Um, they had to cut, you know, make some decisions. And so, you know, that happened, I guess, within an hour. Why don't you talk about the role of ERCOT and how ERCOT, you know, I think there's some misconceptions <clears throat> about what ERCOT does. And you've been in the control room, uh, watch this work. I mean, some people think they, um, ERCOT, quote unquote, was responsible for this. Maybe talk about the role, a little bit about the role of ERCOT and what it yeah. does and, and maybe clear some of that up. Maybe that'd be a good place to start the discussion. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, like I described them as the air traffic controller, it, it's much like the guys that work at the FAA. I mean, you, you take what's there and you work with it and you make sure that how it gets worked with is the most safe and reliable way possible. And so they see what uh, we've got in the way of supply. They forecast what demand is. But, you know, honestly, when that and I don't know if y'all have seen that Jake Gyllenhaal movie called Day After Tomorrow, but where the polar vortex comes over New York City or the more interesting one over the UK and it just freezes the RAF that are flying the queen, just freezes that. It, it was that pronounced, that temperature gradient through North Texas after Valentine's Day dinner was remarkable. And I've, I've, I've unfortunately, I've tried to take screenshots, of all this stuff, and I've, I've just lost it all. But it's somewhere on the internet that shows that gradient. What happened is everybody who went to bed that night left their thermostat on. And of course now 60 plus percent of our homes are electric heating. Um, I've still got natural gas, but again, if the power's out, it doesn't matter a whole lot what you have. Um, but the electric heating just went on a huge escalation. And of, of that 70 gigawatts of load, half, was for heating people's homes through electricity, which is a damned inefficient way to heat a home. But it's uh, if you know if you don't need to put gas in your house, it's one you don't need to put it in there just for heating. It's just been the the way that we've gone in the past years because the power was so cheap and the appliances are cheaper and you know for a million reasons. But in any event, that was a significant driver that night. And so yeah. ERCOT saw that coming and said, "What do I do?" Um, there was only one thing to do. It, it, that, that demand was going up too high for the amount of supply we had. They put the price up higher and higher. The price is actually set by the market every five minutes of the day of your life, every five minutes of the year. We've got a market going on for the sale of electricity. They look at it second by second and they said, we are not getting the response. They put out the response. They cut off the industrial loads who agreed to be cut off. They did voluntary the governor, in fact, and, and others called the industrials to turn down, turn down their load, put their plants on idle. So they all backed off. So a lot of that went on. And yet that wasn't near enough because it was starting to go, it, the, uh, the supply and demand were getting way off. And so that, right. that, that electricity came out of balance. And so when they saw that going out of balance, Brett, um, ERCOT said, we got to cut load, we got to cut it right now. So that was, uh, that was immediate. And so that yeah. was one thirty in the morning till two o'clock where exactly probably, probably 30 minutes we're going to be analyzing for quite a while. Yeah, that had to be a, ter a, a really um, a difficult time to be in the control room watching all this happen. This, you know, this really sort of uh, uh, amazing set, set of circumstances. Um, but, but Pat, you mentioned, you know, that um, we saw a lot of gas generation come off. We saw a little bit of wind and then we saw some nuclear and coal come off. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, what some of the causes of that were. And what, what's your take on, on, we know what went off, but we don't know why it went off. And so, so let's talk a minute for a minute about some of the root causes and some of the things that we're starting to see as uh, causes of these problems, because maybe that can help us figure out how to solve it. Good question. And it is the key question is why did this happen? And what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And as, as you know, Brett, and I remember reading years ago, you, you spoke to this in 2011. Sadly, um, we did not internalize as a state or as a power grid the lessons that we've been here before. So as they say, fool me once, shame on you, Mother Nature, but fool me twice, shame on me. Um, we have been here before. And... Um, Part of it, and it's interesting, is I've had a lot of off-the-record discussions with people in all sectors. Just, I'm, I guess that's what comes with getting gray hair and, and uh, knowing enough about this to be dangerous. But, you know, I think a lot of people did learn the lessons, I'm finding. And, and we actually have formal data requests that uh, ERCOT and the state do to find out from every one of the people that, that was shut down. And there are 22 pages of outages that have, even for some of that was I out. Thought. Yeah. yeah, the five minute outages, I don't care about, even if it's an hour or two, that's just somebody getting their stuff back together. But the prolonged outage sheet, if that could be sifted out, might be pretty interesting um, to, to look at. But that they're analyzing every one of those. So the root cause analysis of why were you out? So I'm thinking, but Brett, it's three buckets. You didn't want your, your power plant. There's something wrong on the on the power side, which would be your power plant wasn't uh, 
insulated well enough or something broke or there was just something on the on the generation side right because we're so integrated with the gas industry that's a big you know supplies half of what we use on a normal in the normal year and on that peak day it was even more than half but you know the natural gas industry which is again at the same time feeding everybody that has natural gas heat at their home keeping that on um, and a lot of people still do. So the natural gas heat was really split between, you know, two markets as it always has been in the winter, um, feeding the power generation and, and feeding the, the, the gas heat for the home. So that gas infrastructure froze up a lot. So then, the, then there was the testimony at the Texas legislature two weeks ago was, you know, we have a lot of elect, and I think Christy Craddock, who's chairman of the Railroad Commission said, our best weatherization is electricity, which right. is kind of indicates, wow, you know, we've come a long way from gas using slipstream gas to compress, you know, stations and power their, their, uh, their gas network. But the gas weatherization, probably not the pipeline so much, they're underground, ground is the best insulator, but um, the, the visible infrastructure, certainly at the wellhead, you know, gas doesn't just come out of the wellhead looking like it does on your stove. It's wet. It sometimes has oil in it. So that has to be treated. So that wet can freeze. And if it makes it to the gas processing plant, the processing plant has to be able to operate. If it's, you know, using electricity for all or part of its operation, that gas doesn't get processed. So the amount of natural gas coming out of Texas went from 20 BCF down to 10 over the week. And actually it mm -hmm. continued through the week till the end of the week. And we feed, you know, we feed 20 to 40% of the nation's gas needs depending on the month. Um, so that had significant price impact throughout all of America was just the drop off of gas availability. So that could have been part of it, gas, gas weather issues. And then the third thing are, are what I just call a pot of commercial issues. Um, as the price of gas, you know, spiraled, even I think parts of Oklahoma, it was $800 an MCF when it, y'all, it's normally seven or $10 in the winter and three in the summer. So, I mean, it went way high. So you had super scarcity pricing going on there. Um, that gets flowed through to electricity pricing as well. So we hit the $9,000 cap quite a few day, few times on the 14th uh, after the power went out and the load started to drop. We had prices varying all over the place. And then the commission set that price um, to, to kind of be consistent with their market rules at $9,000 a megawatt hour um, for Tuesday through the early hours of Friday. We can talk about that in a minute, but okay. uh, that was a, uh, that was a, that so I think three things, you know, commercial okay, gas, so, yeah. gas or, or power. And I don't know which one is going to be the most, but it's going to be one of those three as to why it really happened. Well, so, okay. So that's helpful. You, you think it's, uh, we've sort of narrowed it down to three. We don't know the, the magnitude of each one. So there's still some more work to be done, it sounds like. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about some other things that were potential causes. Let's, let's talk about some of those. Uh, let's talk about, you know, interconnection. Um, people said, well, the Texas grid isn't well interconnected with, uh, you know, we're our own, uh, our own nation here. And uh, as you showed on your map, we're not interconnected. What do you, what do you think about that? That is a potential cause. You know, to, to, <laughs> I think of that little story we, we heard about growing up where you have the old man, little Hans stuck his finger in the dike and he saved all of the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, this was a tsunami coming over Hans. It would have been nice to have had a gigawatt or two that we would have had, um, had the Southern Cross interconnection process, for example, been built. Um, we've had several, um, a, several plans or proposals to connect Texas to the outside that have been approved by FERC. So it doesn't change jurisdiction. Everybody wants to gig it to Texas because so many Texans have been so ugly about California, which I hate that when people get that way about somebody else who's American, but, you know, we've got that spirit in us, I suppose. But, um, you know, to connect to the outside, I think Brett might've been uh, just like plugging a dike that was getting overwhelmed by a tsunami. It might've been nice, but uh, on the margin, but it, I, it wouldn't have changed the outcome. Yeah. Well, the other one that of course gets talked about and, um, you mentioned, and you know, we're 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 guilty as charged as deregulation since you and I were both on the commission. 
and started that. So what do you, what do you think about that? Was it the regulatory model we had here? Uh, how, how do you, how do you assess that? And you mentioned uh, that you may be canceling your Wall Street Journal subscription, I guess, um, based on the story that we've been seeing in the paper today and the well, last week. Yeah, so why don't, why don't, let's talk about deregulation and yeah. uh, how that, how that affected, you know, all of this. Yeah, we've got uh, the 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 direct again. The, there's two parts. There's the wholesale part, in which right. and wholesale the wholesale deregulation or wholesale competitive market really is a nationwide thing. We've got that yeah. all over the country. Uh, we've got a, probably a, a black hole in in the southeast um, where you have got kind of basically the Florida Peninsula and the in the deep south are all in kind of a vertically integrated state um, there with. With their system, and then the West is kind of, kind of disorganized. Uh, California has a has a firm wholesale market that's managing a big transition to renewables, as we are, um, and a lot of other states out there are starting to kind of get the message. But that was that's what I that was my big uh, a lack of success or failure at FERC was to get a decent market structure put in place in the West so that we could come back from their California energy crisis. But nonetheless, everywhere else has got organized power markets where you have uh, competitive generators, both utility owned as well as uh, privately owned or you know new competitors, a lot of new technologies coming in, uh, selling to uh, all, all types of customers, both retail customers like we have here. So that's, a, that's kind of a mix. Uh, so competitive yeah. power markets is probably where you'd probably analyze this one from that perspective. I think the retail uh, competitive market here, which is a separate issue, yeah, I would say probably retail customers in those markets are pretty happy today because you know 98% of them had fixed price contracts and they're not gonna, their bill's not gonna change. Uh, yeah. If I lived in the city of San Antonio, I'd be a little scared, but. Um, so those regulated utilities will pass through. But I think that the question you asked, Brett, is really more about the competitive market at yeah. the wholesale level. And I well, think it's interesting because uh, we've seen the articles about, you know, customers being affected by this. And I think you pointed out that really um, most retail customers in the competitive uh, areas of Texas aren't going to see an impact. Now, we have the gritty issue to deal with, but, you know, by and large, customers have fixed, you know, some sort of fixed price contract or some sort of term contract. So as from a customer perspective, most customers may, may not see this, although obviously there are going to be, so there have been a whole bunch of horror stories about some, some who were exposed to the market. Uh, I mean, what's your, what's your general thought on, on uh, uh, just without getting into the specifics of it on, you know, on what customer had, had the customer impact of this? Well, the customer thing is most important because I do think uh, that what could have been, a, what, what could have been a, major inconvenience to people became a catastrophe because the outages were, were so deep and were not phased in. Like I think most people and I mean, for example, California was ridiculed for their wildfires and how they couldn't handle that. But, you know, as a practical matter, what really did happen, there was those outages were phased over, you know, several days, but everybody had power for at least some of the days. So we didn't, we wouldn't have had houses going to 30 degrees and pipes bursting had there been some ability to keep, in that case, electric heat or at least furnace driven heat from gas fire. You need an electricity to run your fan to blow the, the natural gas fired heat. So had we had some ability to roll those outages and th there's a, you know, there's a lot to be unpacked there with with our local utility, Centerpoint Encore and, and the city of Austin, all the like. There, we do have critical loads. Obviously, you got to keep hospitals on. You got to keep jails on. You got to keep the police station on. But there, you know, there were a lot of loads that were, you know, cut out that night. And so you, the inability to manage in a real surgical, granular way, that customer outage was a huge issue. And I do think um, we've got to make some changes on that. Again, I don't ever want to go here again, but that's not our job to play, to pray. Our job is to fix. And so, yeah. you know, we've got to make sure that outage planning really does a lot. On customer outage, you know, certainly you were, you, we got into this question from a financial issue. Um, there, there are customers. I was one. I love Gritty. I thought their plan was great. I had solar panels and a battery on my house so I could manage the volatility, but I I would never have recommended that to anybody that didn't have some ability to be independent. 
And even yeah. when I saw this storm coming the week before I switched, I just said, there's no way I can manage my way through a storm of that magnitude. We watch a lot of, I mean, people that weren't ready for the storm. I said, well, hell, I watched the weather channel. They talked it in just like channel 13 talks in a hurricane. It was coming. So we were, you know, but any, any event, it was a significant financial impact for the people who, and again, I think there was about 10,000 statewide, 12,000 perhaps by the end uh, yeah. who were on that power plan. But, you know, again, the 7 million that have fixed rates from TXU or Direct or Ambit or Reliant or whatever company they're with, um, you know, we're fine and yeah. we'll, be, we'll be fine. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned the smart meters. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, a vision for the future. How do we, because we've done, you know, uh, Texas has really been a model for innovation, I think, in, in electricity. We have uh, obviously on wind and you're working on energy storage. Uh, there's a number of people, um, uh, my friend Thomas McAndrew has been working on uh, distributed energy resources. Uh, you know, we have all these tools in our tool kit. We've been working a little bit at the center on hydrogen. You know, how do we create a vision that really starts to think differently about, you know, how we use some of these technologies that we have to address some of these reliability issues and maybe not do it the same old way. In, in, yeah, no. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, actually I'm looking as, as you asked me, I think we just got Paresh asked the, asked the question about that as well. I mean, the, the whole future on the, and Brett, you were, you were talking about all this stuff before I even knew what it was. And then, you know, hell, here I am doing it now for a job. It, the, 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 the activity at the virtual and physical edge of the grid is an exciting place to be. Um, I'm building small batteries at the distribution substations across West and South Texas. And, you know, I, that those underinvested in areas have a lot of, a uh, lot of potential to be upgraded. And so do you upgrade it the old way with a bunch of wires in the air, or do you use newer technologies? Do you leverage what, what residences and, and communities can bring to the party, whether that's new investment in community solar, rooftop solar, um, batteries, backup generation. You know, I'm not averse. I'm not so clean and green that I don't have a problem with diesel, diesel back generation. That's fine with me. Those, those resources uh, all over the state, um, in effect, decentralized where we're going. And so this yeah. distributed uh, energy resource world is real. Um, it's becoming much more cost effective. We didn't see it grow in our lifetime because centralized power plants were and plus transmission were so cheap that there's no way you could compete with that. But we're, we're just becoming a much more modular society on so many levels and electricity is not exempt from that. Yeah. You mentioned before, I think in one of our other conversations, you know, the opportunities with smart meters with demand response, you know, if we had all had, um, uh, the ability to reset our thermostats, for example, those of us who had smart thermostats to 65, you know, what the impact of that might be, what the impact of people, you know, who could, uh, you know, decrease their load, uh, commercial customers, industrial customers, you know, so how do you think about, you know, the demand side of this equation and how that might well, play into some of this? I mean, it's the greatest, it's the greatest unmined resource here. I do think that, you know, both instantaneous respond to prices. That's why I like gritty, honestly, is because I'd say, oh, Kathleen, it's going to be, you know, really pricey this afternoon. Let's kind of rearrange how we do stuff. You know, that's really what you do with everything else. If not, you know, gasoline's expensive, you kind of think, well, maybe I'm going to do one trip out today. I mean, you, you do respond to price, whether in the short or long term, just in every other part of your life, why should power be any different? And uh, that would help rationalize the grid. It's just honestly, Brett, I think at the end of the day, been just so damn cheap for so long that we didn't have the incentive to really get efficient with this. And that may still be the case. I mean, my power, I look at it, you know, a, a big part of that bill these days is not, is, is the, the, the fixed cost yeah. that I pay for, you know, distribution and transmission. The energy cost is even lower than it used to be, which is what the benefits of competition have been is that's, that seven cent generation cost now is three cents. That's yeah. a huge savings. But um, you know, but then you kind of think that that creates a less incentive for us to really be responsive on demand. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Pat, we have about 15 minutes left and we got a ton of questions here. So 
I'm right. going to start going to the Q&A. Maybe, maybe we can look at these. So there's a bunch of questions about responsibility for creating and executing a plan for reliable supply. There's a question about coordination between the Railroad Commission and the PUC. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, our friends at uh, 1701 uh, North Congress in Austin, where you and I used to hang out from time to time, and uh, a little bit about, you know, how we get these two agencies, which are very different, uh, you know, when you worked at both of them to uh, to work together, how, how do how do we sort of how do we create uh, you know a, 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 a holistic picture of, uh, of of energy in such a way that we can um, can make some wise decisions about it? Well, my dream world is put it all under one roof. But I'm I'm a political realist. I worked at the Railroad Commission, which for those of y'all that don't know is a historically the oil, the oil and gas regulator of the of the state and is in the constitution. So it's a three-member elected commission that uh, serves on staggered six-year terms. The a PUC is a three-member appointed commission that serves on staggered six-year terms. And I'm sorry, I meant six for both. Um, they're in the same building, but uh, they just soon be worlds apart. I worked at both. I was actually an employee of the Railroad Commission when Bush nominated me to the PUC in 95, working for one of the elected railroad commissioners there. And uh, it's a, it's just a different culture. Um, it's much more um, promotional of the industry. Um, and, uh, and that's good because it's the industry could probably use some help, but um, their regulatory response was very focused much on the production, but very less so on the, the utilities are not very regulated at all. Um, and that's not been, not anything I'm comp uh, criticizing. It's just a very different mindset uh, to what to do. So the planning part of that would be would be a challenge. Um, if you depend you depend on the electorate to put good people in there, you you could obviously have uh, more quality control on the appointed commissioners at the PUC. But uh, you know it just requires. I think you got planners at ERCOT. We depend on ERCOT to be a place where we do the the planning and depend on really the extreme black swan scenarios to be uh, planned for there. Um, that I think uh, was one of the big fallouts here is that we were planning for last year's weather, not for the new stuff that's coming our way. And, you know, as one who just lived through Harvey, you know, the greatest, the greatest uh, water rainfall of all time in North America, um, it, you know, it's, it's a little exhausting to, you know, keep fighting back against the people who say the climate hadn't changed. I mean, my God, let's just admit it and then plan for it. Um, we did not this time. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the things you're saying, uh, and this has come up in some of the questions, is we need to do a better job at planning for these um, huge, you know, these events that are infrequent but have huge impacts. So kind of the tail cases. Um, you know, how, how do we do that? How do we How do we think about not only uh, cold weather, but hot weather, you know, about uh, droughts. We've had a little, you know, Texas is kind of like the Switzerland of weather. We have a little bit of everything here, right? So how, how do we start to think about, you know, these, um, these extreme situations and, and, and do a better job of planning? What, any, any thoughts there? Oh gosh, that's a good one. I see Laura Goldberg asked the same thing too. Who should be responsible for doing that? I mean, I think honestly, in, in a in a democratic society, we elect our le our democratic leaders to to take the role there. And um, you know, you could create a bunch of councils and this and that and the other. And you and I've been on a million of those for our different jobs. But you know, if it's your day job, you get it done. If it's an adjunct to something you're doing, you, you get around to it. I mean, you know, quite frankly, uh, somebody asked me, what's the fix to all this? I said, tell everybody to do their job. And that's just it. This particular aspect that, that you're asking about does not have a person that that's their job. It's a part of the job for regulating the commission. It's a part of the job at the railroad commission. It's part of the job in the governor's office, but it's not somebody's job to actually say this is this is the world we're planning for we're planning for it in gas we're planning for it in power we're planning for it in water i mean that's why i'd love a, an infrastructure commission that does all three regulates all of them and you know just pushes the politics aside but well yeah. that's kind of an interesting idea so maybe what you're suggesting is there needs to be sort of an uber 
commission to look at uh, planning for the state, to look at all these issues and how, how we ought to be thinking about holistically about the entire picture. And I would and I'm and I would just put the whole caboodle under there. I mean, I'd say do the regulation as well. I wouldn't have a separate regulator. I think the thing I learned as a federal regulator yeah. is when you set federal regulations, but the states have to implement them. Um, that kind of work that works for National Highway Transportation Association, I think, and then works for the Office of Pipeline Safety, maybe. I haven't seen it work much anywhere else. So if you have one regulator with the ability to to make the rules, but also that has to live by them, I do sense a certain there's a certain uh, balance that comes from doing that that I, I think would make some sense but again I'm a political realist and I don't want to waste your viewers time dreaming about that great nirvana uh, okay. we gotta we gotta we gotta stumble through nonetheless with with Texas's bifurcated structure well it sounds like just getting the planning right that would be a good thing that I agree I agree and that could well be uh, it's better than it's better than nothing is put that all above but but then what do you do with the plan I mean I think we had the wake-up call in the 2011. Uh, that again, you wrote so eloquently about. I had the opportunity wow. to read your op-ed, but we didn't act, and so the, we got a legislature that meets once every two years, and we've got to work really hard to get their attention on something. This got their attention, I will say, but uh, I do, uh, and I like the responses I'm hearing. They're actually responding in what I think pragmatic, thoughtful ways. The bills I've seen so far this week seem to be uh, addressing without uh, getting shrill or hysterical or you know also not shrugging it off either but being kind of balanced uh, thoughtful approaches that you know we can't finish it before you know the facts but obviously they're making some assumptions about where the facts were leading but yeah. uh yeah it's responsible but uh it's it's hard to get the focus um we're a big state with a lot going on i think this uh, was a pretty arresting event yeah you know, one thing that I um, I tend to come up in the questions that we didn't talk about, and I can't, um, I'd be remiss if we finish this without asking you, is uh, the techie market design issues. So we, I think we ought to just, you know, uh, talk about that for a second. You know, capacity versus energy, and maybe you should just spend a second explaining what that means, and then talk about, you know, the the model we have in in in, uh, in Texas versus the model in the um, eastern part and other parts of the um, uh, of the country. So quick, uh, it's like renting a car. You used to kind of do a per day rate and then you do a per mile rate. Similarly on the capacity and the energy market in Texas, we have a per mile rate, period. You, you, you pay it, you pay for it every time you use it and you pay for it as you use it. And sometimes it's expensive and sometimes it's not. A capacity market, you prepay part of the cost three years. You look three years down the road and say, we're going to pay a slug of cost for our future PJM capacity today. So you, they do a capacity auction and then everybody gets the bill and it's spread kind of like peanut butter across everybody. So you prepay for that. That generally means that your, your per, uh, per mile rate goes down a little bit because you're, you're prepaying a slug of a per day rate, you're okay. So that's a crummy analogy, but it's, it's kind of the one I've always been able to, to get into people's minds with is, you, you have a two-part rate or you have a one-part rate and we have a one-part rate and sometimes it's good and um, sometimes it doesn't send a whole lot of good information for people about when is the best time to invest and and that's really what the PUC's tried to make some tweaks and changes over the years without going to a capacity market. The large industrial customers are very opposed to a capacity market. Yeah. And they're very, you know, they use 50% of the power in the state. So they, people, you know, they're listened to as I did and you did as well. We, you know, we care about them coming here, but to put a capacity market is effectively putting, you know, a, a surcharge on everybody uh, up front. And uh, they want the ability to, as they did last month, to step off the system when prices get high, they would just, they just turn it off. And so... Yeah. Uh, which isn't a bad thing. It just, we didn't have enough of that, unfortunately. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is the problem really wasn't lack of capacity. It was the capacity we had that didn't really work very well. Yeah. And that so that, statement? yeah. And so that could be, again, engineering issues could be uh, fuel supply issues. And it's, we, we talk about gas, but even the coal piles froze up. I mean, when that wet rain or that wet precipitation got into really granulated uh, coal, but no, not granulated yet. It's still chunks out there on the on the on the pile outside the plant. 
it yeah. turned into bricks. They couldn't bring up. So it's coal. I mean, it could be fuel or again, commercial issues. So we'll figure that out in the weeks ahead. Well, well Pat, this has been really a great conversation. We've got about five minutes and I want to just, you know, give a few parting thoughts here. So let's just talk about, you know, where, where do we go from here? Um, how do we start to pull all this back together, address the issues, create, you know, not kill, throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. What, you know, you've been around this for 20 years uh, in, in a very number of different roles and commercial roles as a regulator, the state and federal level, as a, as a close confidant of the governor. How do, how do we move forward here? What, what should we do? What's your advice? Well, we got to think about where we're going and where we're going is a very different, a very different grid than what we've got. I mean, this is going to look like a hiccup. If, if we get it right, it'll look like the happy wake up call because we're, we're going to be, I think we already are the, the vision of the low carbon future. I hope we won't have blackouts of this, uh, this nature, but it definitely is a huge, um, we're the harbinger of that. We've got 30,000 megawatts out of our 80 or 100 on that chart. Uh, 30,000 of those are wind and solar and hydro. Hydro's a little bit. Nuclear adds another five for in Texas. So you got those low carbon resources are here. In the queue to be studied and a regulatory study at the, at the ERCOT various levels of review is another 60,000 more megawatts. So that alone, if they all come in, just, you know, I just always cut it by half, but half would be 60 out of 80. Um, we've got a lot of renewable energy coming here because the good Lord gave us as much above the earth as he did below the earth to exploit and turn into energy that we can use. So uh, we'll be smart enough to do that. We can use the technologies to do that. It'll certainly have environmental benefits. But I'll tell you what, Brett, I would not want to have to think about getting through another cold day. Um, and that day was, I didn't have a lot of solar. I wasn't generating much, uh, much solar energy for the wood house. The wind was still, um, and it was, uh, it, the batteries didn't last that long. I got a Tesla Powerwall in the, gar in the garage. It did get me through about 14 hours, but mother-in-law got a little cold in there in the room with the without the furnace uh, about three in the morning so you know though those uh, I don't want to live through that again without um, the robust dispatchable firm resources that we have here so that's a long hand way of saying we got to keep these plants around and we got to figure out how to clean them up um, I'm really confident in the uh, that the platform we have here in Texas that is open and allows people other than utilities to to do the job to get in and invest and and try new things. They're gonna we're gonna figure out how to clean up the emissions so we don't put a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere when we are running a coal plant, when we are running a gas plant. Yeah. Um, we're gonna figure out how to do small modular nuclear power plants so we don't have to worry about the great big ones here, but you know, small things that you could, you know, see across the state and the nation, the world that are really providing that firm power on the bottom of that stack we saw earlier. So that's going to happen here. The innovation is going to happen here because it has to. We don't have an alternative. If we want Texas to be the great engine that you guys at the center think about, you know, constantly, um, and you want it, it's got to be low carbon because we can talk about that every which way the Wall Street Journal wants to not talk about it, but it's here and it's going to happen. So we need to just get it over with and instead of fighting it, own it and make money off of it. That's the greatest Texas way there uh, is. Make that's money. the green. It's green in more than one way, right? Got it. We've been talking about it at the center for a number of years now that um, we can have both a um, reliable, low carbon and profitable uh, energy sector in, in the state of Texas. And uh, maybe that's the big takeaway from this, um, this event and maybe from tonight is that, you know, we can make this happen and we just, we need to get to come together, solve some of the problems and, um, and, and show people how it's done. Well, that's the Texas way, isn't it, Brett? There you go, Pat. Pat, it's always great. You know, I, I enjoy these conversations uh, so much when we do them. And it's, it's just a shame it had to be a, a, a catastrophe like, uh, like we had. I mean, the number of people uh, were affected uh, by this in, in so many different ways. Uh, but I do think, you know, the, the silver lining here is um, 
the opportunity really to start to pull this together. And the industry has always done such a good job at that. And you've been such a leader in that for many, many years. So well, you're uh, one to talk. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, you know, I think I, I think Brett, just to, to wrap, I, I I think my my heart's been really heavy this month. Um I, you know, people died. I mean, that's that's um and if I could have done something to fix that, God knows that's the first thing I'd do. I'd I'd throw every market principle, every rate case, everything we did, all the glories we had to get those people back. I, I just absolutely you know, I've got four kids of my own and just thinking about that, that little boy in Conroe. I mean, that just yeah. breaks my heart, but I mean, that, that is why we do this is we, we did the deregulation effort so that we could get a better market for our customers. We could have more innovation. So we'd be better. And if we can't turn this into that, then shame on us, but we haven't been in that world before we can, we have always turned the old uh, sow's ear into the silk purse, and this one will be another one. Well, Pat, thank you so much for being with us. I know you're going to be um, uh, doing this uh, same act, maybe in, in front of Congress in a day or two. <laughs> so hopefully we were a dress rehearsal for you tonight. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks to everybody who stuck with us. Um, we had about 130-ish attendees oh, wow. uh, tonight. So um uh, thanks to Steve Horn and the Harvard Club and uh, my colleagues at the Center of Houston's Future for, um, for helping us put this together and uh, look forward to continuing this discussion and uh, with the HBS Club and certainly with um, uh, the work we're doing at the Center. Uh, Pat, uh, safe travels. Thanks for the time and, and look forward to continuing the discussion with you uh, going forward. Good. Thanks, BP. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Bye now.